And the question that I seek to ask is, uh, does this agreement, peer disagreement, defeat knowledge? So, if you haven't, if your belief amounts to knowledge before you realize that you're in a disagreement, then you disagree with a peer, does that disagreement in itself defeat your knowledge? Now, in order to try to answer this question, I will make two quite heavy assumptions, but those assumptions, I think, are well motivated since where many epistemologists nowadays do uh, argue for these claims. And the assumptions are that the safety condition is a necessary condition for knowledge, and that knowledge is the known belief. Now, the safety condition, very roughly, says that the subject's true belief that P amounts to knowledge only if the subject couldn't easily have heard in her belief that P. And the knowledge of belief says something like, you should believe that P only if you know that P, or your belief that P is permissible only if, or permissible only if you know that P. Now, given these two assumptions, I try to look at where your beliefs can be safe in the face of disagreement. If they cannot, then you should suspend your judgment because your beliefs don't amount to knowledge. And yeah, we'll see whether disagreement does have such kind of power. Now, the plan of the talk is the following. First, I will uh, lay out the safety condition and the knowledge of the belief. Then we'll take a look at epistemic peerhood. Then we'll take a uh, look at cases of real peer disagreement. Then at cases of apparent peer disagreement. And then we'll look at how the own model approach to disagreement that I advocate is situated in the conformism versus non-conformism debate. Yeah, two assumptions were that the safety condition is a necessary condition for knowledge and that the knowledge is the belief. Uh, that knowledge is the normal belief. Now, there are some um, representative authors who advocate these things, and I think that's like very lots of people do tend to argue for these things. Importantly, there are some persons who argue for both of these, like Williamson and Little John and Sosa. So, even if you think that these assumptions are not true, then you can say, what would, like, what would Williamson say about this agreement? What would Williamson do? He's like Jesus or something like that. <laughs> okay, so the knowledge of belief. I think that the knowledge of belief can be interpreted in very many ways, and I want to remain quite open about how to interpret that. Here are two interpretations that I think um, are, well, they might be plausible or not, but they are something that people argue for. The, the first one is probably quite a lot stronger than the second one. It says that in believing that P, you are rationally committed to knowing that P. And this is advocated by Gibbons and Humor. And the uh, lower one, that number two, says that in believing that P, one is aiming to know that P, and that knowledge is the epistemic standard of success for belief. Now, these two interpretations of the knowledge of belief are not mutually exclusive, so you can have both of those, or think that both of those are true. And I think that at this stage we should accept both of them since it's just an assumption. Now, one can ask what this aiming here means. I usually, or I think that it should be interpreted as putting a normative constraint, as Rafe does. So, but he doesn't advocate that knowledge and belief, but that truth now. So, but still, I think that one can, or it's usual to think that it's understood as putting a normative constraint. So there's that, and then the safety condition. Here's a very rough formulation of the safety condition. The safety condition is usually cashed out in terms of possible worlds. Now you can dispense the possible world stuff, but I think it's useful for for me because I I imagined I think that what goes on in possible worlds, but <laughs> maybe that's um, not true. But anyway, the safety condition, uh, when cashed out in terms of possible worlds, says something like. A subject has to know that P only if in all the nearby possible worlds where the subject continues to believe that P, while the same method of belief formation that she uses in the actual world, her belief will continue to be true. Now, there are two reasons, or probably more than two, but two reasons why I think that this is uh, not a very good formulation of the safety condition. The first has to do with something that Duncan Pritchard has argued for, and it has to do with the fact that when we when we think about knowledge, we need to think about safety in terms of a continuum of tolerance to epistemic risk. So we care more about the risks that inhibit the, or exist in the very close nearby possible world, and less about the risks in proportion to their distance to the actual world. So that's the first point. And the second point is that this 
uh, formulation of the safety condition is then unable to deal with cases featuring necessary truths and sta uh, stable contingent truths. So the reason for the, this is that uh, a belief in a necessary truth will be trivially safe because there won't be any nearby possible worlds or any worlds at all, in fact, where a belief in that necessary truth is false since a necessary truth is true in all possible worlds. But of course, not all beliefs in necessary truths are not to knowledge. If I use a malfunctioning calculator to calculate the product of 12 times 13, and as a result end up uh, with a necessary true belief that it's 156, then my belief ought not to amount to knowledge because the calculator must malfunction and give him uh, answers at random. So it doesn't seem enough that the belief that I formed in the actual world is true in all nearby possible worlds where I continue to form the belief in order to me, for me to be safe as an epistemic agent. So, I think that when we require uh, that the subject belief ought to be safe or that the subject ought to be safe from error, we're not only requiring that the belief that she forms in the actual world has to continue be, to be true across nearby possible worlds, we're claiming that the subject has to be in a safe epistemic situation with respect to her inquiry, that she couldn't easily have gained false beliefs at all with respect to her inquiry. So, I think that we should globalize the safety condition to a set of propositions in which the subject could easily have formed a belief in, in the possible worlds. Now, in order for this globalization to have any possibility, we have to restrict the relevant set of propositions somehow. Because we don't want to claim, for example, that Barney in the barn safe case doesn't know that the sun is shining simply because he could have formed a false belief <coughs> about some bars. So we want to restrict the set of propositions somehow. Now, I propose that we restrict the set of propositions in terms of subject matters of inquiry. So that you have a subject matter of inquiry, for example, in that malfunctioning calculator case, uh, the subject matter of my inquiry is what is 12 times 13, and then I can form different kinds of beliefs about what is 12 times 13, like it's 146, 147, and something like that. Maybe I'm so mathematically incompetent that I can't see that obvious conclusion, and I'm just going to rely on the uh, machine. And other case that doesn't want necessary truths, consider that I believe that the sun is shining outside. In order for that belief to amount to knowledge, I should not form false beliefs about the weather <coughs> outside uh, in order for that belief to amount to knowledge by using the same kind of sensory apparatus. Um, so, in order for my belief to amount to knowledge, I should not form false beliefs in nearby possible worlds that are something like it's sleeting outside, or it's snowing outside, or raining outside. In Finland, it's always sleeting or snowing or raining. So, <laughs> okay. So I think that the following this formulation of safety is much better than the one on the previous slide. So this says that S knows that P, which belongs to a set of propositions P, when this set of propositions is understood in terms of subject matters of inquiry, and she knows <coughs> only if in only about possible worlds where S believes in a proposition belonging to the set of propositions by the same method M that S uses in the actual world, S's belief is true, and in all of the very closest possible worlds where S believes in a proposition belonging to P by the same method M that's used in the actual world, her belief is true. Now, the fact that there are two kind of conditions is supposed to respect the continuum uh, aspect that Richard is arguing for. Now, I think there are two quite similar reformulations of the safety principle, one by Duncan Pritchard and one by T.T. Williamson. And they differ in how they uh, want to restrict the set of propositions. Uh, Pritchard basically says that you don't have to restrict the set of propositions in any other way by claiming uh, that they have to arise from the same method of belief formation. I think that's problematic, but I won't go into that argument now. Williamson, on the other hand, restricts the set of propositions by claiming that the propositions have to be close to each other. So he restricts in terms of propositional closeness. I don't know what that means, but um, I think it's a primitive concept for um, Williamson, but I think that my primitive concept, subject matters of inquiry, is a much better primitive concept because it's more important. But that's not important for the talk today. So now that we have these two um, assumptions laid out, let us look at cases at the definition of epistemic period. Now, as you all probably know, there are two Two, two formulations of epistemic peer group that I think the first one, the easy E definition, evidential and cognitive equality definition, is more widely spread. So 
on the ECE definition, a subject, subject S and a star are epistemic peers with respect to the question whether P, if and only if they are evidential and cognitive equals with respect to P. And the probabilistic equality definition advocated by Elvis says that they are epistemic peers if and only if they are conditional on the disagreement equally likely to be mistaken about P. Now, I don't have any conclusive argument against either one of these definitions, but I wish to provide a new one that I think will be somewhat easier to operate on in the context of this talk, since we're assuming that some kind of safety condition is necessary for knowledge. Um, in trying to come up with a new definition of epistemic peerhood, we should think that what should epistemic peers be like? Well, they should be peers with respect to epistemic matters, that question that they are peers of. So they should be rough, have roughly the same amount of knowledge regarding that subject matter, they should have roughly the same amount of justified beliefs about that subject matter, be, have roughly the same amount of true beliefs regarding that subject matter, and they should be disposed to form true justified and knowledgeable beliefs about that subject matter to roughly the same extent. Now, if we assume that a global safety or something in its vicinity is necessary for knowledge, then the following definition of epistemic peerhood seems to fall out. And this definition, S and star are epistemic peers regarding a set of propositions P, only if S and star have true and false beliefs in propositions belonging to P to roughly the same degree across the scope of nearby possible worlds in a similar distribution. So their modal profile regarding the relevant set of questions should be similar enough in order for them to count as peers. Now the similar distribution clause here is meant to rule out cases where, where we have one subject who, who has true beliefs, the subject has the same amount of true beliefs across um, possible worlds, but one of them has true beliefs um, in all of the nearby possible worlds, but false, the false beliefs that she has are located at the outer rim of the space of possible worlds. Whereas the other one has only false beliefs in nearby possible worlds, but for some peculiar reason, true beliefs at the outer rim of the space of possible worlds. I think that those subjects should not be epistemic peers. So that's why the similar distribution clause is here. Now I said that uh, I don't have any knockdown arguments against the ECE or the PE definition of epistemic peerhood, but I do think that this model definition of epistemic peerhood does have some virtues over these uh, other definitions. The first virtue, I think, is that actually we don't often share the same body of evidence. It's very strange that two people would ever actually share the same body of evidence. And this is something that Jennifer Lackey and Marcus Langaranda has emphasized. So we often are in a position of personal evidence that's accessible only to us about our own mental state, so to speak. And the other reason why I think that this definition is slightly better than the ECE definition is that um, often it's demanded that the evidence should be fully disclosed between the disagreeing parties. But as Sosa emphasizes, it's often very difficult to, that the evidence we have is often so subtle that we cannot actually cite it or bring it to focus in a way that we can share it. But on my definition of epistemic peerhood, we don't have to claim that the subject have to be evidential and going to be equals. So they can have strangely a different body of evidence. It doesn't have to be exactly the same body of evidence. But of course, usually it will be pretty much the same body of evidence if you're going to be an epistemic peer with someone. Now that we have this model definition of epistemic peerhood, let us look at some cases of uh, real peer disagreement. Now, this is that classic, oh, I don't know why the picture came over there. It must have something to do with the Apple computer. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't use this. Okay, so, but there's nothing really important behind that thing. So, I guess that this case is uh, quite familiar to all of you. So, the case is originally Christensen, but the wording here is Lackey's. Um, so, in this case, we're dining with four of my friends, and we all agree to the bill 20 tip and split the cost of the bill. My friend Ramona and I rightly regard each other as peers where calculations are concerned. We frequently dine together and consistently arrive at the same figure when dividing up the amount owed. Now, after the bill arrives, we each have a clear look at it. I accept with confidence that I have carefully calculated in my head that each of us owes 43 bucks. 
and to my surprise from all Nasser's, with the same degree of confidence that she's carefully calculated in her head that each of us owe 45 bucks. Now, before going to any intuitions about this case, um, let us look whether this can be a disagreement between real epistemic peers. Now, Lucky has noted that on the evidential and cognitive equality definition of epistemic period, it's rather um, strange to view this case as a case of a real disagreement between two epistemic peers, because it's very hard to see how the subject could be cognitively as good and share the same evidence in this kind of case and still disagree about the outcome. But of course, in our definition, there's no problem because they don't have to share the same body of evidence. So in my definition, it's entirely possible that I and Ramona are epistemic peers, but that it's the case that, for example, Ramona ended up with a true belief, while I end up with a false belief. It only means that we can have a similar kind of distribution um, of true and false beliefs across the scope of nearby possible worlds, but that we actually end up disagreeing in the actual world. So real epistemic peers can, on the model definition of epistemic peer, disagree in this case. And now, given how the case is set up, that the word rightly regard one another as peers, we ought to consider this case of real peer disagreement, where we actually are epistemic peers on the model definition of epistemic peer. Now, let's suppose that my belief is true, that each of us owes 43 bucks. Can I satisfy the global safety condition in this case? Arguably, I cannot. The reason being that I and Ramona have the same kind of model profile towards this set of propositions. And Ramona acquired a false belief in the actual world, which basically means that there is a very close nearby possible world where I acquire a false belief. So there is at least one nearby possible world where I acquire a false belief, where I believe that each of us owes 45 bucks. But if that is the case, then I cannot satisfy the global safety condition, because it said that in all the very closest nearby possible worlds, your belief has to continue to be true. So, I can satisfy the global safety condition. Assuming that global safety is necessary for knowledge, I lack knowledge in this case. Okay? That's... Okay? I think that's with what the intuitions also say about this case. I don't know if you have different intuitions, but to me this is a clear case where we should suspend our judgment. And the knowledge now, of course, tells that, of belief, tells us that we should suspend our judgment, because my belief doesn't amount to knowledge. So, I think that we can get this case right. But um, the model approach to the epistemic significance of disagreement yields the same kind of cases regarding, okay, this is really strange, something wrong with the Apple computer, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay, but anyway, I'm happy that I don't have bigger pictures. Oh, by the way, these pictures are quite strange also. They're from Codex Bielf. Um, which depicts German, German martial arts uh, from the 16th century. They're really, really uh, nice pieces of art. But anyway, this is the horse race case by Adam Elgar. So in this case, you and I are watching a horse race between three horses and his behaving batteries not included in Cadillac Jack. Now, suppose that we are epistemic peers and the model definition of epistemic peerhood, and when it comes to evaluate, or regarding when it comes to evaluate, which horse won the race. So, now the race is a quite close one in that we do have the horses are not that far apart, which finishes that finishing point first. Um, and we're, um, but we have quite a good vantage point, and each of us is fairly confident in our judgment when we conclude which one was on the race. But to our astonishment, we disagree about the outcome. You believe that the is behaving one well, I believe that better is not Now, as I said, the model approach to epistemic significance of disagreement yields the same results regarding this kind of cases, that for all cases of real peer disagreement. So, uh, given that we are epistemic peers, the situation could be one of the, or a correct description of the situation falls into one of the following camps. So either it is the case that both of us have a false belief, since Cadillac Jack won the race, um, in which case both of us lack knowledge, since knowledge requires truth. Or it is the case that you have a globally unsafe belief, uh, since your epistemic peer, me, has a false belief in the actual world, in which case we both lack knowledge, since knowledge requires global safety and truth, or it's the other way around. Either way, we lack knowledge and should suspend our judgment. So it seems that we 
get this kind of skeptical argument. Okay, Apple computer and my memory stick and PowerPoint slides really don't go well together. So, the premise one is that in all cases of real peer disagreement, both parties of the disagreement lack knowledge. Premise two is basically the knowledge of belief. One should believe that P only if one knows the P. And the conclusion is, of course, that in all cases of real peer disagreement, one should suspend judgment. You might think that that sounds very really bad because we disagree a lot with people. And suspending judgment seems also very bad in many cases of disagreement because we, should, we want to act on our beliefs and so on. But if we actually should suspend our judgment, then we can't act on those beliefs and so on. But I think that this skeptical result can be diluted because we're not committed to saying that in cases of merely apparent peer disagreement, we lack knowledge. Maybe our beliefs can be safe and amount to knowledge in cases of apparent peer disagreement. And therefore, maybe we can hold on to those beliefs. So let us look at cases of apparent peer disagreement. Now, I think that the case of apparent peer disagreement is the follow of following kind. In a case of apparent peer disagreement, two subjects falsely believe that they are epistemic peers regarding some question. <coughs> And they disagree about the truth value of P. So it's a real peer disagreement in the sense that there is a real disagreement about the truth value of P. But the peer who is merely apparent, they are not really peers. So cases of apparent peer disagreement are very easy to come up with in a modified version of the Bill calculation case. Uh, Ramona is actually very bad at making calculations, but you believe that she's very good at making those. In a modified version of the Horfer's case, I have very bad perceptual abilities and have forgotten my spectacles at home. But for some reason, you believe that I'm maybe justifiably believe that my perceptual abilities are in working order. Now, can you satisfy global safety in these kind of cases if your belief is true? Now, I don't think that there's any reason to suppose that you cannot satisfy global safety in such cases. Because after all, if, if you disagree with me and you are the superior and I'm your inferior and your belief is true, then the fact that I acquired a false belief doesn't mean that there would be a nearby possible world where you acquire a false belief. So your beliefs might be globally safe. And if they might be globally safe, you might get knowledge, depending on how the world is. And therefore, you might satisfy the knowledge of belief. And therefore, your beliefs might be permissible. Um, in which case, full blown skepticism is diverted. And here it's supposed to be fancy power poetry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have diverted the full blown skepticism. Now to the final part of the talk. Now I think that the kind of results that I get but with the model approach to disagreement. Um, <coughs> locates a very fruitful middle ground between the conformist and non-conformist positions. So the non-conformists say that we should, or the conformists say, sorry, that we should give equal weight to our own beliefs and those held by our epistemic peers. And basically this means that in cases of peer disagreement, significant, significant doxastic revision is called for. Maybe you should suspend your judgment, but at least you should lower your credence. The non-conformists, on the other hand, disagree and say that the mere fact that you disagree with an epistemic peer does not mandate any doxastic revision on either side of the disagreement. And there are again some, some philosophers cited by taking these positions. Now the non-conformists have the upper hand as I, I gather nowadays, and the conformists have pretty much like been uh, put down. No, we're not put down, but they, they're not as popular anymore as the non-conformists are. So there are different versions of non-conformism and it's not the case that you always can continue to believe what you believe. But it's not the case that you always would have to suspend judgment or you would always have to lower your credence. Now, on the model approach to this agreement, uh, we can claim that the conformists get the right result regarding cases of real peer disagreement, but deliver the wrong result in cases of apparent peer disagreement. Since in cases of real peer disagreement, you actually should suspend your judgment. But in cases of merely apparent peer disagreement, you can hold on to your beliefs. So you don't need to suspend your judgment. And on the other hand, that non-conformists get it the other way right. So they give the wrong verdict regarding cases of real peer disagreement, but give the correct verdict regarding cases of merely apparent peer disagreement. 
Therefore, by adopting the model approach, we can tap into the intuitions of both conformists and non-conformists. And I think that this, this result is um, further strengthened by the fact how non-conformists and conformists have argued for their respective positions. So, Jennifer Lackey, for example, has argued that non-conformists have actually focused on cases of merely apparent peer disagreement. And one reason why this would be the case is that the non-conformists, oh well, the non-conformist strategy is something like this. When you disagree with someone who you take to be your peer, you can search for reasonable grounds of demotion, demoting your opponent as not being anymore your epistemic peer. And then you can appeal to those grounds, and you can think that she's no longer your epistemic peer, and then you can hold on to your own belief. Now, Kelly, in writing when reasonable demotion, uh, when such demotion is actually reasonable, says that whether you're demoting me is reasonable will typically depend on such things as whether my best attempts to carry objections are weak and unresponsive as you take them to be, or whether your conviction that they are weak and unresponsive is due to, for example, you're being dogmatically so committed to the opposite conclusion that you fail to appreciate the merits of what I say. Now, what I think is the moral to be drawn from this passage is that Kelly is actually demanding that the reasons have to be true. They ha have to be weak and unresponsive in order for the demotion to be reasonable. If the grounds for demotion are not true, then, then you can't demote reasonably. So, it seems that actually, if the grounds, if my, my um, claims were unreasonable or unfounded to begin with, then we never really were epistemic peers to begin with, and therefore, the case was merely between apparent uh, peers. Uh, and they, it seems that the conformists have focused on other kinds of cases. They have focused on cases of real peer disagreement, because in such cases, the grounds for reasonable demotion, will, they won't be there, because by definition, you can't, the, if the grounds have to be true, there won't be any true grounds between uh, subjects who are in, well, Black talks about, accepts the ECE definition of epistemic peer. So there won't be any true grounds for reasonable demotion cases where you're actually evidential and cognitive equals. Now, Lackey, of course, thinks that cases of this kind of idealized disagreement are very rare, because she thinks that accepts the ECE definition of epistemic period. But on my approach, we don't have to think that cases of disagreement between real epistemic peers are rare. They might be quite common, in fact. Now, another, I think, virtue of the model approach is that I can say that, well, the conformists are right about the kind of cases that they were, were focusing on, while the non-conformists are right about the cases that they were focusing on. I think that's pretty nice. Yeah, what do you have? So, yeah, um, finally, the answer to the question, what is the epistemic significance that disagreement has over knowledge? You might think that it's huge. In all cases of real peer disagreement, one should suspend her judgment. But that conclusion would be quite hasty to draw from this presentation or talk. <coughs> Actually, disagreement doesn't have any power over knowledge. And this might sound strange, but it's a logical conclusion to draw, because after all, in real cases of peer disagreement, we do lack knowledge, that's true. But the fact that we disagree with someone does not make our beliefs unsafe. Our beliefs were unsafe already to begin with, because the fact that we disagree with someone doesn't change the moral profile that we had originally to that question. So, disagreement doesn't defeat knowledge. It's just the case. It happens to be the case that in all cases of real peer disagreements, however, we fail to be safe to begin with. So, the mere fact that you disagree with an epistemic peer can rob you of knowledge. And in this respect, the conformists, the non conformists, were totally right. Thanks. Uh, the aim of this paper is to assess the epistemic power of peer disagreement. And Yakov takes, at least for this paper, this question to be about whether or to what extent disagreement can change one's epistemic circumstances such that one, can know, one cannot know the proposition about which peers disagree. As he puts it, the question is, can disagreement defeat knowledge? And Yakov answers no to this question and concludes that 
quote, this agreement does not have any epistemic power with respect to knowledge. To show why this is, why this is the case, Yaakov distinguishes, as have others, between apparent and actual peer disagreement. It turns out in his account that if I have knowledge, apparent disagreement does not undermine it, and if actual peer disagreement obtains, then I don't have knowledge. But this is not because of the disagreement, but because actual peer disagreement is only possible if my belief is not safe, and so does not meet the conditions of knowledge. And to understand why this is so, you just have to, it's important to keep in mind the global safety condition. Now, one of the important virtues of the account, as Jacob points out, I think, is that it can accommodate both conformist and non-conformist intuitions. And also because Yako is very careful in the paper to circumscribe his claims and to say that, look, given these assumptions, if these assumptions follow um, that uh, there is this global safety condition on knowledge, that knowledge is the norm of belief, that we understand epistemic peerhood the way that he has said that we should, um, then his conclusion about disagreement's lack of effect on knowledge follows. So if we accept all those assumptions, then we get his conclusion. Um, so the main question that I would like to see addressed, um, and that often seems, and actually at the very beginning, before he started talk, giving his paper, he mentioned this, which wasn't in the actual paper, but um, that often seems to be most pertinent in disagreement literature, um, and I think we saw that really clearly in Michaela's um, uh, talk yesterday, is what should my subjective doxastic attitude be in these situations, and whether disagreement should affect it. Should I, for example, become less confident in my belief or lower my credence in the proposition? Now, so it's possible on his view that in cases of apparent disagreement that I have knowledge, but it's also possible on his view that I don't have knowledge. And his main claim, Yako's main claim, is that whether I do or not is not affected by disagreement. And if I happen to be in a case where I do know, then knowledge won't be defeated by disagreement. But does that mean it doesn't affect my epistemic situation at all? Now, as I said, Yako has limited his question to disagreement's power with respect to knowledge, and so it may seem unfair um, for me to ask about its power with respect to questions about credence and confidence, given that he's talking about knowledge. But we, we see that he does end up getting to that question. He does say something about this, especially when discussing actual peer disagreement. And that's where the knowledge <coughs> norm of belief gets invoked. Because there's a, a, a possible world uh, very close to mine where my belief would be different, one in which I believed as my epistemic peer believes, my belief is unsafe even if it's true. So he asks, this is a quote from his paper, what ought I believe then? So this is a question about what my doxastic attitude should be. And it says, and goes on to say, the knowledge norm of belief tells me I ought to believe that P only if I know P, therefore I should suspend judgment. My belief falls short of the aim of belief. In short, my belief is impermissible. And so that's, I should change my doxastic attitude. And what about in cases then of apparent peer disagreement? What should I what should I do? How, if at all, should I change my, should my doxastic attitude be affected? Now, so obviously, I don't know when I'm in a situation of real or apparent disagreement. I know that if it's real, according to his account, I should suspend. I also know that if my belief is safe, then disagreement doesn't defeat it, does, does not defeat its safety. And thus, this is another quote from, from Miyako's paper, I can remain steadfast in my belief. Again, this is what the knowledge norm of belief tells me. But even if this is all right, even if that's all okay, how will this help me in actual cases of peer disagreement? Be they real, um, be they, sorry, yeah, in actual cases of real, of real disagreement, be they real or apparent. So I'm in this situation, right? And Yako's suggestion, maybe Yako's suggestion, and I, I, and I thought about this before, and then I, I thought some of the things that Michaela was saying were, were kind of echoing this possibility. Um, Maybe his suggestion is that disagreement, when I find myself in these situations of disagreement, can prompt me to examine the possibility of my belief falling short of knowledge. Um, it could be a clue, maybe, that my belief is unsafe, like I should check, because then I'm in this disagreement situation. So I told myself when I agreed to comment on this paper that I wouldn't critique the knowledge norm view, um, because it was, it's, it's, just, it's supposed to be just this assumption, if we assume this, then this will follow. Um, uh, it was clearly laid out as an assumption, but I think that 
when we look at the way it addresses or it fails to address uh, these questions about levels of confidence or have what some people would call degrees of belief, reveals one thing that's problematic about, about it. Um, as Yako puts it at the beginning of his paper, if our beliefs fall short of knowledge, then they fall, quote, into the realm of ignorance and so should be discarded. Now this, this binary seems problematic in that it suggests that all beliefs that fall short of knowledge are equally bad. Um, now, Iago at one point does indicate that a belief can still be rational, though impermissible. So in the, in the, in the case of actual disagreement, he says I should, that, it's, that it's impermissible to believe, but it might be rational. And perhaps this is where we can have a, we can find a more nuanced or degreed evaluation can enter in. And so then I wonder, my question is, even if disagreement does not have any power over knowledge, does it have power over rationality, over belief's rationality? 